Well, uh, many, many years ago, uh, there was a college student at Azusa Pacific University, and he was just getting ready to graduate. He had no idea what he was going to do after that. He didn't have a job yet. Uh, he was wanting to get one, but he just like had no idea what was going to happen. And uh, one day, he said he was sitting on campus, and um, a girl that he had been crushing on for the, the last semester happened to walk up to him, and she said, um, hey, I understand that there's an opening to teach English in the Czech Republic. Um, I think you should sign up for that. And he said, okay, I'll sign up for it if you'll go on a date with me. So that happened, right? Later on, he was talking with his mom, and he said, mom, he said, the good news is I've got a job after college. Uh, he said, but it's going to be somewhere else. It's going to be in this place called the Czech Republic. And she said, oh, well, where's that? He goes, I don't know, someplace in Africa. And um, he had no idea, right? But he soon found out. But that was a life-changing moment. You know, I talked about those moments. It was a moment he had not anticipated, that any, but his life changed dramatically. And for the last few years, he has been ministering in the Czech Republic. Uh, he is on the staff of, um, oh, now I just forgot the name of it, uh, but Josiah Ventures. And uh, we support them. They are a new ministry that we are supporting. Um, you are going to love him. His name is Kevin Dixon, and he's here to speak to us this weekend. So would you give a warm Bridgeway welcome to Kevin Dixon? You know, the, the worst part of that story is the flop, or the date was a flop. Like, it was a nightmare of a date, but God knew what he was doing. I later found out that the Czech Republic's in Europe. It was a slightly different demographic than what I was expecting, but yeah, those are bygones, as we say. Good morning. I want to start off this morning with a story about a little boy, actually, uh, by the name of Josiah. But before we get to his story, we actually have to know a little bit about his daddy and his granddaddy, two gentlemen, well, I use the term gentlemen lightly, that you would not want ever to show up your house or any of your family celebrations. Uh, Josiah's dad, uh, this guy was so bad, so evil, that after being in charge of the family business for only two years, his co-workers, his colleagues, conspired to kill him. Josiah's granddaddy, <laughs> this guy was so evil, so twisted, that not only was he into uh, foreign and espionage and shady political maneuverings, he had this dark inner side that involved human sacrifice, at one point forcing one of his sons to walk through fire as part of a sacrificial rite of passage. And this is the background an eight-year-old boy named Josiah, and at age eight, Josiah's dad is killed, and in the resulting turmoil, Josiah is made king of Jerusalem. So the year is 640 BC, and the situation honestly is a mess. Uh, the Israelites haven't followed God in who knows how many years. The leading powerhouse of the area, the Assyrians, are beginning to weaken, and over the course of Josiah's reign will eventually be overthrown by the Babylonian Empire. It is the definition of a political, economic, and spiritual mess. And at the age of eight, Josiah is put in charge. Now, I don't know what you were doing when you were eight years old. I grew up in Southern California, and as an eight-year-old boy, uh, I was thinking, you know, when I grow up, when I'm in charge, I want to be a firefighter slash CHP motorcycle officer and take some weekend trips up to the moon, <laughs> right? That's what eight-year-old boys do, but Josiah, see, Josiah did it differently. In 2 Kings 22, the Bible tells us that around the time that King Josiah is 16 years old, he begins to seek after the Lord. By the time he's 20, he's realized that the city he's living in, the, the country, the nation that he's ruling, is a mess. Now, granted, moms, it took him 12 years to realize that his room was a mess, but he did eventually get there, and he said, we need to step into some social reform. And so at the age of 20, King Josiah begins a social reform to clean up the city, literally doing hashtag trash tag before social media was invented. And in that efforts to clean up the city, to clean up the town, to clean up the country, the temple is put back into order and they discover the book of the law. Now we believe that that book was the book of Deuteronomy and they bring it before Josiah as he's sitting on his throne and they read it to him. And as those words washed over Josiah, he rips, he tears his robes in two as he realizes how far he and his countrymen are from God. He immediately calls the entire nation together and has that book read to them as well. 
And then collectively, together, the entire nation of Israel and Josiah commit their lives back to following God. (laughs) The, The Bible tells us that this rededication was one of the greatest returns back to God ever. Josiah then went and spent the next few years going around the countryside and ripping down altars that had been erected, dedicated to the worship of foreign gods, of idols, of all kinds of things, hedonistic worship. And so Josiah went around and he would rip down these altars and burn them to the ground. And then he would gather up the ashes and scatter them to the wind, saying, there is no other God, small g. There is no other God besides Yahweh. The Bible tells us that when they celebrated Passover, a massive celebration remembering everything that God had done for them, that when they celebrated Passover, that no Passover like it had been kept in Israel since the days of Samuel the prophet. None of the kings of Israel had kept such a Passover as was kept by Josiah and the priests and the Levites and all Judah and Israel who were present, and the inhabitants of Jerusalem. That, that is stepping out of our comfort zones to turn your back on generations of evil and commit your life to following God. (laughs) That's it. But it wasn't just that Josiah was committing to follow God. He was doing something grander. He was stepping into a grander story, the story of the mission of God. Uh, My favorite author on the topic of mission is a guy named uh, Christopher Wright. And Christopher Wright says this. He says, mission, mission from the point of view of our human endeavor means the committed participation of God's people in the purposes of God for the redemption of the whole of creation. I love that. I love that our committed participation in God's purposes leads to the redemption of the whole of creation. The Apostle Paul, he would phrase it maybe slightly differently. In Acts 13, Paul says this. He says, for this is what the Lord has commanded us, I have made you a light for the Gentiles that you may bring salvation to the ends of the earth. Hmm. But what does that look like? I mean, honestly, I'm assuming that, like myself, you're not a king. Maybe we like to think we are, but you're not a king. You can't implement social reforms that are going to change this entire country. So let's summarize, though, what Josiah did after hearing God's word, after being convicted by the Lord... He committed his life and the lives around him to following God. I can do that. I can do that. You can do that. And so maybe this idea of stepping out of our comfort zones looks a little bit like my friend Tomash. See, when I first met Tomash, Tomash was studying at university. He was working on a master's degree in computer science. But he was passionate. He, wanted, he just didn't want a degree. He wanted the people of his town to know Jesus The problem was is that the city he lives in is this massive industrial city, and at the very heart of the city, there's a corridor. It's five and a half miles long by two and a half miles wide, dedicated to the manufacturing and production of steel. It supplies steel over all over Central and Eastern Europe. It's a hardworking, blue-collar kind of town with all the pains and struggles of a primarily industrial city, alcohol abuse, broken marriages, low income, kids wandering the street because it's safer on the street than at home. And that's where Tomash lives. That's where Tomash goes to church. And so while Tomash was going to school three and a half hours away by train, he would come home multiple times throughout the week because he was convinced that the kids in his city needed hope, the hope of Christ. Hear that again, he would travel three and a half hours by train to spend a couple hours with some kids to then spend another three and a half hours on a train, all the while doing homework, writing papers, studying for exams, because Tomas is sold out to the idea of hope. He could have had it easier, huh? He could have had it easier. He could have said, Jesus, you know my heart is to serve you, but I've got this school thing. You know I'm going to serve you, but first I've got I to gotta finish school. I've got to get a job. 
You know I want to serve you. I'll serve you as soon as I, you know, as I find the one. I'll, I'll serve you as soon as the, you know, the kids grow up a little bit. I'll serve you when the bank account looks a little bit better. I'll serve you when life settles down just a little bit. Can I ask you, has life ever settled down a little bit? No. See, taking the gospel into a place that was hard, stepping into challenges, that's stepping out of your comfort zone. He stepped out of what was comfortable to make a difference for the kingdom. Or maybe it's like Daniela. And I have to tell you that I'm hugely biased about Daniela. She's my wife. Um, and so this story is slightly biased. Yet I love this story because it has absolutely nothing to do with me. See, way before we even met, when Daniela was still in elementary school, her teachers told her, you know, Daniela, I just don't think you're going to make it. You're probably not going to ever graduate from high school, let alone go on to college or anything else like that. You should give up now and just get a dead-end job to an elementary kid. But Daniela sold out for Jesus. And so fast forward 15 years, not only has Daniela graduated from high school and has a college degree from a Bible school, Daniela is launching a ministry into public high schools, taking the gospel into the classroom, literally launching ministry in the places that are hardest for her. She's taking the gospel into a public classroom. And, and during the first six months of that ministry, after hearing a gospel proclamation, an entire classroom stood up, prayed, and accepted Christ. Taking the gospel into the places that are hardest for us, stepping out of your comfort zone. See, I'm convinced in this, that all of us in this room are called to the mission of God. We're called to be a light in our communities. We're called to sacrifice our time for those who need to hear about hope. We're called to clean up our cities. We're called to remind ourselves and all of those around us of how good God truly is. But we get hung up. We get hung up on things and say, well, you know, Josiah, he was a king. Tomash, Tomash was different. Kevin, Daniela, they're missionaries. Who am I? Who am I? I've got a regular job. I'm still going to school. I don't know what I'm supposed to be doing. I don't even know with whom I could share the gospel. And I think, actually, I know that whenever we get hung up on questions like that, we have to turn back to Jesus because after all, whoever claims to live in him has to walk as Jesus walked. See, everywhere Jesus went, he talked about the kingdom and his father. He stepped into relationships of all kinds with all kinds of people. And as I've looked at Jesus' life, I see six groups of people that Jesus interacted with. I'm going to go through this really quickly. We could do six sermons on this. I've got less than six minutes. So you're going to have to do some of the like, work on this. But here we go. The first group that I see Jesus interacting with Strangers, you've got this in your notes here. Strangers, John 4, 1 through 10, it's the story of the Samaritan woman at the well. We know the story. We know the story. We know that when, when within 30 seconds of, of Jesus talking to this woman, he's taken a conversation about a glass of water and turned it into a spiritual conversation about his father. He's talking to strangers. I see Jesus talking with God seekers all the time. Matthew 19, 6 through 20, 16 through 22 talks about the rich young man who wanted to know more about God. He was seeking after God. He wanted to know, what do I have to do to have eternal life? But this group of God seekers is so much wider than just that person. Did you know that within a 15-minute drive of this church, there are multiple Mormon churches there's a Jewish community center, three stores for new age products, a Christian science center, multiple spiritual living centers, whatever those are, and at least five spiritual mediums, I'm going to call them false prophets, that advertise on Google within a 15-minute drive of this building. They're all seeking the spiritual. They're all seeking after something 
who's going to share with them that only Jesus is their true hope? I see Jesus talking with family members too, and not just his own immediate family, but the extended families of his friends as well. We see this in Mark 129 through 32. And in fact, if we keep reading that passage, we see that those conversations led Jesus to talk with his neighbors and other people from the town. Mark 133 says that the whole town showed up to talk with Jesus. Can you imagine just for a second if all of Roseville showed up here next week? because we chose to step out of our comfort zones. Jesus talked with his coworkers too. I don't know if you've ever seen this. Matthew 9, 9 through 13. It's the story of when Jesus first meets Matthew, his disciple. And as they're talking, they get invited back to Matthew's house and they start eating. And Matthew says, hold on, Jesus, this is really great. But first I gotta make a phone call. I gotta call up all my buddies from the tax offices and invite them over. And all of his coworkers and buddies from the offices come over to talk with Jesus. Can I ask you, how often do we invite our coworkers over for the intended purpose to share with them about Jesus? And finally, I see Jesus talking with his friends all the time. Luke 8, 1 through 3, Matthew 12, 46 through 50, two examples of dozens where Jesus talks with his friends about his father. If you've copied this down, if you've written this down, you now got the beginnings of a mission prayer list. I believe that if we're taking this seriously, that God is giving you a name or a place or a people group in each of those six circles Somebody that he's saying, I've chosen you to witness to them. I've chosen you to engage with those people to step into the mission of God. Because ultimately, that's what we do in the mission of God. We pray, we give, we go. We pray for God to put names on our heart or places to go, places that he wants us to engage with. And then we give that to that. We give of our finances. We give of our time, our resources, our knowledge. We give of ourselves to that. And then we go. Sometimes go means to the other side of the world. Sometimes go means coming back from the other side of the world to come here and share with you. But most times, most times go, go means getting up out of our chairs and entering into the world with the committed intent to share Jesus. As I've been praying over this message for the last month and a half or so, as I've been praying for you for the last month and a half or so, I keep coming back to this one thought. I keep coming back to this one idea that today, today in 2021, we are inundated, overwhelmed, we are saturated, we are overwhelmed with the amount of materials and resources and opportunities that God is placing in our lives to engage in the mission of God. I mean, just today alone, we've heard three stories, testimonies, if you will, of, of Josiah, of Tomash, of Daniela, three people who stepped out of what was comfortable to engage in the mission of God. You've got a piece of paper in your hands right now, potentially with six names that God's asked you to go share and be a light to. And on the other side of that wall, there are 21 missions organizations that are very excited to talk to you and find out how they can help you engage in the mission of God. Three stories, six names, 21 organizations. And I ask you the question, in all of that, in 2021, when we have all of that, what? What? It's not a what question. It's a who question. Who is stopping you from stepping out of your comfort zone? Thank you. Hi, Bridgeway. My name is Miriam Doonan. Hey there. Hi, my name is Cecile. My name is Tony. My name is Lisa. Hey there, I'm Chad Friedrich. My name is Yana Bukasenko. Hi, I'm Alyssa. And I'm Aliana. Hi, my name is Heather Wright, and these are my daughters. My name is Lindsay. I volunteer with Agape International Missions. I'm a volunteer at the Union Gospel Mission. I volunteer at Mercy Multiplied. 
I went on a missions trip to Russia with E3 Partners Ministry. A volunteer with Powerhouse Ministries. I have been on a missions trip with Josiah Venture to the Czech Republic. I am a volunteer for the Sacramento Memorial Garden for the Unborn. We are volunteers at Bridgeway Community Closet. And we volunteer at Sierra Pregnancy and Health Center. And I volunteer because we're rescuing real girls and real women from being trafficked. God has given me skills and talents that I want to use to bless others. The reason we volunteer is because it benefits the community by providing food to families in need. I love spreading God's love and working with organizations that aim to support and empower women. I get to share Jesus Christ with our guests and they share with me as well. Now the reason I love partnering with Josiah Venture is the way they not only proclaim the gospel to those who don't know Jesus, but through their partnership and their mentoring of local churches. I work with our interns to help equip them to become leaders in their community. I want to spread the love of Christ to the ends of the earth. The reason I volunteer is to help those suffering from miscarriage, stillbirth, or abortion loss find healing. Not only are we rescuing them, but we're protecting them from ever being trafficked in the first place. They want to see gospel transformation. So join me. Join me. Join us. Join me. And step out of your comfort zone. And step out of your comfort zone. Give it a try. We'd love to see you. Join me in stepping out of your comfort zone. Step out of your comfort zone. Thank you.